we're just really happy to have this exhibit as part of this program. And just to give you a little bit of background, I'm we've been very interested in this topic, the idea of, the, of women who are sort of um, reviled um, just for being strong women and things like that. There's a long history of people like that. Magdalena, Mary Magdalene is one of them. La Malinche from Mexico's history, who, who brought Cortez around, you know, was a guide for Cortez and gives a lot of horrible things written about her just for being a guide to Cortez. But women, a lot of women who are very strong, you know, in history get, um, you know, get these stories. Um, I just read, you know, Considering today was the England, the, England, the prince's royal wedding today, I just read something about um, a pr there was a prince Matilda in the 12th century in England who decided to claim the throne and women couldn't claim the throne, so she claimed it her in the 12th century. And people claimed her of an arrogant demeanor, demeanor instead of bearing the bearing proper to, gen to the gentle sex. So if you're if you decide to take things that, that are owed to you, you're considered aggressive and arrogant. Cleopatra, we always think of Cleopatra as this woman who just used sex to bring down Mark Anthony and Caesar. Cleopatra is actually very intelligent. She spoke a dozen languages. She was educated in mathematics, philosophy, and astronomy. She was a great um, politician, but of course we only remember her as the mistress of male politicians. So uh, again, history doesn't always do right. If Hillary Clinton thinks she's had a hard time, um, this has been going on for a very long time, this sort of um, reviling of, um, of strong women. And I don't know if any, and actually speaking of Hillary Clinton, she wasn't the first woman to run for the presidency. Victoria Woodhull in 1870 ran under the Equal Rights um, Party. And um, she ran for, during the Gilded Age, ran for the presiden presidency. She was a spiritualist and a fortune teller, so people sort of looked down on her. She also owned a newspaper and a stock brokerage. And when she ran for the presidency, Harper's Bazaar depicted her as a devil in their cartoons and accused her of having a lot of affairs. You know, that was their way of having, you know, saying she was really bad because one, she had these really radical ideas. She believed that women should choose who they were gonna marry and would have the right to divorce. So she was considered really radical at the time. So this idea that like, that, that's what kind of draws me to the stories of, the, of Mary Magdalene stuff, that there's these women that there's another story underneath everything else. So people like Tanya, people like Alessandra can bring out this, this story um, in other ways. And then the Black Madonna, which we're going to get to in a moment, is sort of tied to the Mary Magdalene stories. I don't really want to bring it up. I would bring it up. I really don't want to. The Da Vinci Codes, as people probably are very familiar with the Da Vinci Code, and that sort of made the connection between the Mary Magdalene and the Black Madonnas and things like that. People in the popular imagination know the story from there, but there's a lot of other, a lot of other information there. Please go deeper. Um, but the Black Madonnas have a connection. The Black Madonnas in Southern Europe have a connection to the folklore and the stories of Mary Magdalene, um, the stories that aren't from the Bible that are told later on elsewhere in the oral, oral tradition about where she went to to do her preaching and her ministries. And so that's where people think there's some connection with the Black Madonna there. So the Black Madonna are these incredible statues and icons through different parts of Europe, but mainly in Southern Europe, and um, where you have these actual statues that are show black women and um, people if well, the church would always say well that was just because the candle smoke um, made their you know made the wood dark but of course the rest of their clothes stayed all different colors that didn't change but they would you know use these stories to say anything to prove that there couldn't be people couldn't have worshipped the you know a black woman but um so th those th those stories are um also probably have their origins in sort of the goddesses that might have been honored way before Christianity, the Isis, Isis who was, um, had a major cult all throughout the Mediterranean prior to that. But, uh, you know, she traveled again from the Middle East to Southern Europe. She traveled again to the New World, to the Western Hemisphere. And we have in the Caribbean and Mexico other um, sort of representations, manifestations of her. And we're going to get a little, little, some people are going to talk about that today and do a little bit of music and dance to that as well. So I'll introduce them all as they come on later on. But first, we are going to see um, a documentary by Alessandro Bellone about her um, her. Um, contact in her work um, with the research on the Black Madonna, and she did she followed the pilgrimages through Italy, southern Italy, of the Black Madonna. So what we're going to do now is do some of the music um, from the devotions to these Madonnas. I, as I tell you the story, I, I know that there is a question and answer, so if you want to ask me questions, you can, uh, because I know nobody's, unless you've come to Italy with me, which I lead the pilgrimage every summer, starting August 4th, I don't think you've ever seen this, right? Has anybody ever seen this before? Has anyone been to these places? No. Did you know that we have such a strong musical devotion to the black Madonna? Uh, you did, okay. It's very important now, with all that's going on in the world, that we bring this to the world. The female aspect, the black, 
all of that. So I want to say before we do the music, um, maybe I, I need a little, can I have a little more sound on my voice? Just, um, because I'm going to be moving with the drums. That um, my work is, you know, again, I started out of devotion, out of being healed, out of a vision, and I was guided by her uh, without knowing uh, what she really meant. The first book I got is called The Cult of the Black Virgin by In Bag. It's a great book and describes all the different goddesses, the Earth Mother, and also talks, of course, about Egypt and Africa. But I, I really believe now, after all these years, that she's been guiding me all along. So, and now I know a lot of people that are finding her because it's her time. Just like Elena was inspired with Bobby to do this night. It's really her time. What's going on in the world is so crazy, and I don't think we have a lot of time left unless the black mother figure takes over with the compassion, with the un symbolizing being united and not divided. So more than, I don't want to say anything else about that. <laughs> so we're going to say some, uh, some words about the legend. Um, give me a second here, I need my drum. We're going to begin with the, the, the legend that I was saying. It's the legend of the seven sisters. In our tradition, there are seven black Madonnas that are seven sisters, or seven Madonnas that are seven sisters. And the legend says that the last one was believed to be the ugliest, so she ran away to a very high mountain to hide. And then when they found her, they found that she was the most beautiful of all the Madonnas, and she was black and they called her Mamma Schiavona, which means the serving mother. And they, this place is called Monte Vergine, a sacred mountain, where in pre-Christian times, there was a temple of the goddess Cibele, the black goddess of the earth, where people honored her with the, drum, the big drums, the frame drums, and in, in very uh, powerful uh, fertility rites, dancing, drumming, and going in ecstasy. In that mountain is where the poet Virgil was also initiated and he became a mago poeta, a shaman, healer poet. And he was initiated in the mysteries of the goddess Cibele, for which many men became women and they were called Galli. So they had to be female to honor the goddess. And uh, this tradition is still practiced, believe it or not, in Naples. They're called Femminelli. So Virgil had so much power, he was so worshipped in Naples still today, that they believe that he was the sun god. So we're going to do a chant dedicated to the sun. Keep going.
Ce sole, scaldiente imperatore, scaldiente mio d'argento, che vale 400, 150, tutta la notte canta, canta, viola, un mastro de scuola, mastro, mastro, manna mena l'anza, che già ire in Francia, dalla Francia alla Lombardia, dove sanno da Malucia, non chiovere, non chiovere, che già ire a muovere, muovere il grano, da mastro Giuliano, non chiovere, non chiovere, yes, yes, sole. to be here with an amazing musician, Steve Gorn, who's playing a variety of instruments. He's a master of the Bansuri flute from India, and believe it or not, there is a connection between India and Southern Italy, right? Steve, we're gonna talk about that shortly. <laughs> um, so, we're going to go to the first Madonna in the big opera that you saw at the end, the uh, clip. We have a lot of people. Um, as Virgil starts his journey, he unveils different goddesses and different Madonnas. In that opera, the first goddess to appear was Isis, because she is considered the most important of all the different other goddesses, and she was connected to magic. So there's a lot of esoteric tradition in the, the worship of the Black Madonna. And Isis was very, very important in the south of Italy. So in the in that was his journey, and in when he unveils Isis, then she introduces him to the uh, Sicilian, the one you saw, Madonna del Tindari, the first one. Uh, that's what we're doing, right? <laughs> Migrasum, right? Yeah, so, uh, because I mean, it's an opera shrank into like seven songs right now, but. So uh, this Madonna that you saw in the beginning is very powerful, very old. They, the, the, um, they think the statue was done in the year 500 AD, the, but the settlement is pre-Christian, Pindares, and she came, say, some people say from Ethiopia, some people say from Egypt. Ethiopia because of the inscription, Nigra Sum said Formosa, I'm black and beautiful. Uh, that inscription is the Song of Solomon, and she's the Queen of Sheba is supposed to be from Ethiopia. But the cult of Isis, as I said, was very strong. She arrived, on a tempest, and they will carry her to the mountain. She made many miracles, but the important miracle is that one day a woman came to pray to her, and when she saw that she was black, she didn't believe she was Mary, the mother of Christ. So in that same moment, her daughter fell off the cliff, and the Madonna made a miracle, and a um, beautiful strip of sand appeared, who, that saved the little girl's life, embracing her, and that's where those lakes were formed. They're so, salt lake, salt water lakes that always have the shape of a woman. So the song we wrote is called Nigra Sum Set Formosa, and it's a prayer to the Black Madonna. Let me 
Clemenso Pia, Utucis, Virgo Maria, Mater Deo, Clemenso Pia, Utucis, Virgo Maria, Mater Amata, Intemerata, Ora, Ora, Pronopis, Mater Amata, Intemerata, Ora, Ora, Pronopis, Magna Mater, Gloriosa, Mater Eterna, Misericordiosa, Magna Mater, Gloriosa, Mater Eterna, Misericordiosa, Nigra Sum, Nigra Sum, Nigra Sum, Se Formosa, 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 Nigra Now we're going to the other region that I love very much, Calabria, where you saw the wild tradition with the giant puppets, the flag, dancing with the drummers. And that tradition is still popular today, that Black Madonna, Our Lady of the Poor, was found in the year 951, 951, but that settlement already existed in Ta Taureana, and that um, temple where she was already worshipped was burnt in the 700s, in, in the year 700, and then one night these people saw, as they were looking for food, the poor people, they saw a lightning strike the earth, and they were um, scared, they called the authorities, and they decided to dig and see what was there, and when they dig, they found this beautiful statue intact, so when they tried to lift her, the authorities, the rich people, the Madonna wouldn't be lifted. She became really heavy. So when the actual poor people that found her lifted her, she became light. So she became known as La Madonna dei Poveri, Our Lady of the Poor. And many, in many uh, places I've been to, the research I've done, it's really important to acknowledge that she's the mother of all, with compassion, universal love, especially the people that are outcast and not accepted formally in the society. That tradition is very strong with the Tarantella rhythm and is very similar to um, devotion that was done, but it's no longer done in Spain, Our Lady of Montserrat near Barcelona, Black Madonna, very powerful. So this prayer is, that comes from Spain, in, but is also connected to Calabria, was done in the Middle Ages when people lived in, with fear of the end of the world, the plague coming to town, and the Crusades, so very similar to what we're living through today. And in those times, they did what you just saw in the film. They span around, they danced, they called for the Black Madonna power, and they got rid of the fear with this musical exorcism. So this is called Cuntissimus, which means let's sing, rejoice to Mary, and it's another Maria. Ah! 
gotta do that, you know that, right? And bring together the Orishas. We have to do that. I felt that very strong. We gotta do this together soon. Uh, by the way, that's a musical exorcism. I think I can share this when I do that. I always try to get rid of the evil power of the United States, Mr. Trump. So every time I do this, I'm thinking, Madonna Nera, help us get rid of this evil, like they did in those times. So now, if you, can you explain about the Indian connection we have? The Indian connection. Yes. Okay. It's not the, <laughs> the pizza yeah, it's connection. It's, it's short. <laughs> so I started playing with Alessandra about, um, my God, 30 years ago, yeah, a long time ago. And I have a whole um, uh, tradition that I fell in love with in India of Indian classical music. And that's what I was playing. Yeah. And I heard her play. And I heard that, let's say that first piece that she sang. Yes, she's so <laughs> So I hear that piece, and what I realize is that that same scale and that same feeling is actually the root of Indian classical music. And it all of a sudden sounds Indian. If I add a little something, now this is, of course, not extremely traditional. <laughs> this is an electronic version of what we call a tambora that gives this background drone sound and listen to the way that same piece is going to sound if I add that. Get a little bit of D-train, is that it? Yeah, okay. Okay, here we go. Here's the pure melody. But if I Indianize this, it'll be... take one or two notes, and this is where the contemplative spiritual tradition of this is, that I just hear two notes that are part of really all the melodies she's singing. Kind of the tension of this and the resolution.
few stories with Steve, but the first recorded recording we did together, I brought it to Italy, you have it here. He's playing the high flute, which is like the Sicilian Fiscaleddu, and someone that I actually had learned from how to play the drum thought I had hired the shepherd from Sicily, and it was Steve Gorn. <laughs> No shepherd from Sicily, Jewish from New York originally, but Indian in and soul. So the beauty of this, uh, this uh, of course, music is one, but there is one root for sure, especially when it comes to healing. And um, so the piece we're going to do next is the one I wrote that is dedicated to this uh, connection of the Black Madonna to the Mary Magdalene. Um, there are many aspects of the devotion of the Black Madonna, and one is really strong is Southern France. It's called San Marie de la Mer. Saint Mary's of the Sea, and I went there once, but I had studied a lot, is the protector of the gypsies, and there is a huge statue there that they call Santa, Sara, La Kali, like Kali, and the goddess Kali from India is a black goddess. And there is a, a lot of legends around that, but one of the important ones is that this is a place where they believe Mary Madeline arrived by boat with the other two Marys. And there is a cave where now there is a a crypt where they say that she stayed. And then there is this statue that appears from the sea, just like the other Madonnas, who's connected to Kali from India because the gypsies that worship originated in Rajasthan. So I'm telling you, once you start do, doing this re research, it's endless, you go crazy, but you find that she's really all over the world. So I was inspired to write this piece. Saint Marie de la Mer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you gonna start it or should I start it? <laughs> Santa Sara Lakali, you are the black Madonna. Santa Sara Lakali. 
Italy, you are the Black Madonna. Mother of the waters, we come to you for blessings. Mother of the waters, protect us from the seas. You are the Black Madonna, we will sing for you. You are the Black Madonna, we will dance for you. Santa Sara Lakali, you are the goddess Isis. Santa Sara Lakali, you are Aphrodite. Santa Sara Lakali, you are the Mary Magdalene. Santa Sara Lakali, you are the Mary Magdalene. pieces. Uh, so the Madonna that I am most devoted to is the one you saw uh, at the end, Our Lady of Freedom, La Madonna della Libera. She has a, another legend. She came on a boat in a tempest, some say from Turkey, and um, she has been there forever. So this Madonna is the one people know the least about. Uh, except that she was very popular in the Middle Ages, and in pre-Christian times, there was already a temple there. They know that because of the archaeologic, archaeological finds. But I know for a fact that there was a devotion to Isis in that area, in the town Benevento, that is also known for witchcraft and magic. So that Madonna is very dear, because the day that we were lost with my ex-husband looking for another Madonna, we ended up there, in that town. There was no one there. We entered the church and we saw her, and the caretaker said, if you need a miracle, she will do it. She's the Madonna della Libera. She will free you. And at that time, my ex-husband had problems, not only with drugs, but with the law. So he wasn't that free. So, and when we were there praying, we saw the center star move for a while before we both saw it, spoke to each other, la stella si muove. And then we started breaking down in tears. We knew it was a miracle. There's no, no explanation. All of these miracles happen, but there is no real explanation from the scientific world. And she was welcoming us. And instantly, really, my husband changed completely his life and became sober. So that's why I'm most devoted to her. I went there many times, and I've experienced other powerful moments. So we wrote this song for her, for this miracle, Il Canto della Madonna Brunetella. Jacob, 
Passi l'eternità Madonna della libera Regina dell'anima mia Regina dell'anima mia E qua te bella chiamare Maria If you know it you can sing it with me Madonna della libera, regina dell'anima mia, queen of my soul, regina dell'anima mia, qua te bella chiamare Maria. It's beautiful to call upon Mary. One more time. Madonna della libera. Regina dell'anima mia, regina dell'anima mia, e qua te bella chiamare Maria. Thank you. Remember this prayer. It's very powerful prayer. I've used it many times. So at the end of our journey, we go where we began in Monte Vergine, the sacred mountain of the Black Madonna, Mamma Schiavona. And we're going to do the chant that is traditional for her. And it's called Canto della Madonna di Monte Vergine. At the end of the journey, Virgil in our story and in my story, we found that this beautiful ancient sacred site to the goddess Cibele, uh, is connected to uh, another, another legend, which is like a myth of creation. And people believe that a black meteorite fell from the stars and landed in Anatolia, Turkey, and in other places. And then this stone, this black stone, was carved when the Romans, under the prophecy of the Sibyl, had to uh, build the statue of Cibele to win the war against Hannibal. So that's stone was brought to Rome and it was made into the statue of Cibele. Now in that place in Rome, it's a church that you can see, it's called Araceli, the, al the, altars, the, the altar of a heaven, and there is a black Madonna in there. So in this uh, opera that we wrote, we ended with this knowledge that there is a, a myth of creation connected to the black Madonna and that Virgil found the answer that the black Madonna is also the earth mother as a living being that we need to respect as the old people and the ancient people did for thousands of years. And she's the beginning of life, the womb of the mother, the dark side of the moon, and the African mother that we come from. So she embraces everything. And the miracles in these places really happen still today. And they always will, if you believe in the universal's mother, unconditional love. su montagna una e io mi trovo mamma schiavona io mi trovo mamma schiavona e bello a chi te ne maranno ma pare doi e se la e ma pare doi e se doi e se l'illuminata mamma mia si incurunata Mamma mia, sei in curna. E con tutta sta compagnia, sta te bene, maronna mia. Sta te bene, maronna mia. Sat 
the bone, Marona mia, Lanna cabane, Turna ma beni. Lanna cabane, Turna ma beni. E se non ci vedi, mamone. Mamma spietta c'è un paraviso Mamma spietta c'è un paraviso Si mi chiude, si mi venuto Quante grazie che mi ha avuto quante grazie che vi mando This is the dance for the black Bella signora che a te chiama rosa, bella signora che a te chiama rosa, che bello nome mamma uè, che bello nome ma, che bello nome ma, ma dove da mi so, chi le bova bova bova, Dammi su un uomo bello delle rose, dammi su un uomo bello delle rose, un meglio sciore uè, mo' veni e io me la, yeah! Un meglio sciore cam, sta in paradiso, yeah! Chi le vuol fa, chi le vuol fa, chi le vuol fa, vuol fa, vuol fa? E lo mare vive nel cuore, Ricchi in tra che in tra bonnello Figli a mano vado in te Le facce fa tu le cene La rinta rinira Thank you very much. Sandra Ballon. I know there's going to be a great program coming up, La Guadalupana, right? Um, thank you, Elena. Thank you, Bob. I just want to say, you, you can come in. I, I have some flyers of my pilgrimage coming up August 4th through the 16th to the sacred sites you've seen in the film and more. I only have one or two places left. If you're interested, let me know. I do it every, every year. And we have some CDs with this music, but it'd be great to stay in touch because it's uh, important today that we stay together as a community because we can make a difference in the world, right? <laughs> Muchas gracias. Once more, an applause for Alessandro Bellone and Steve Gorn. That was fabulous, as always. I, I want to invite up to the, to the stage now um, 
Tanya Torres and Vivian Reguero. So talk, we're going to move now to the Caribbean. Um, we're going to move to talk a little bit about um, the Black Madonna and the Magdalene, um, the Black Madonna manifestations in the Caribbean. And um, Tanya Torres, is the, um, as you know, is the artist whose uh, exhibit we have up. She'll talk a little bit about um, Puerto Rico and and her art. She can talk a little bit more about her artwork. And Vivian Reguero is um, a musician, lyricist, composer, and visual artist. She's worked with a lot of Latin jazz musicians, jazz musicians, and as, uses as a basis of her work when it's music and in the visual arts, the Orishas of um, Western Africa. So um, I want to welcome Vivian and Tanya to the stage. Un aplauso, por favor. Mm. Hello, everyone. Okay, so, yeah. so good evening to all. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to first um, thank Elena because uh, Elena was the one that invited me to participate in this program. I feel very honored to be in the company of Alessandra and of Steve and Tanya. It is wonderful to be here. I would be remiss if I do not acknowledge um, our ancestors that have guided our steps towards this place. In all the places in the world where we could be, we have chosen to be here, to reunite and to grace the Black Madonna. And I would also have to mention uh, Ms. Mayores, my teachers, because Without their teachings, I wouldn't be able to speak tonight. So um, I'd like to honor my madrina, Ibaetonu, Regla Perez, Orodosumi, Ibaetonu, Guido Gozier, Ibaetonu, Moacir Santos, Ibaetonu, to all the people that have come before me in the tradition of Ocha and that have accumulated and given us their knowledge in order to be able to speak tonight. So I've um, written something very brief and I would like to expand after, uh, after that. These are some visuals that are going to complement uh, the talk. You are going to see uh, attributes of Oshun. You are going to see a grove in Oshogbo that belongs to Oshun and where um, an annual festival takes place in the, in the month of August. There are also attributes to her in terms of nature, the flora and fauna. And then I have some visual art of my own that are there to um, assist me in telling you some stories, some patakin and some ordu. But first I'm going to um, read a little bit about Oshun. Thank Oshun, the complex mother of sweet waters. Oshun is within the Yoruba pantheon, one of the main female deities. She is assigned the realm of waters, together with Nana Buruku, 
that is the owner of swamps and marshes, Olosha, which is the owner of lakes, and Yemaya, the mother of seas and oceans, being her domain, rivers, cascades, waterfalls, and brooks. Oshun governs fertility, love, the erotic, the arts, diplomacy, and divination with cowrie shells, the system called the Logun. She is in charge of the birthing and rearing of children, of tactics and strategies, of all that pertains to beauty and adornment. Hers are joy, music, dance, and material wealth and transactions in the marketplace. The creation of sustaining communities, alchemy, and healing. She also governs the culinary arts understood as the day-to-day -day synthesis of a people's culture. Oshun is alchemic, vivifying, generative, nurturing, collaborative, intuitive, perceptive, and ultimately transformative. She is life, systole and diastole, triumph, defeat, and lessons learned. Oshun is love expressed fraternally, erotically, tenderly, and the energy of love manifested in ideals that are conquered through effort and sacrifice. She is the principle of incessant hope which conquers despair. Among her attributes are sunflowers and honey, cowrie shells, copper, gold, and bronze, hummingbirds, bees, wasps, and butterflies, crocodiles, buzzards, and peacocks. She owns mirrors and reflection, a mortar to prepare healing potions and deadly ones to conquer mendacious beings, needles and threads, turtle combs, coral and amber, fans and precious stones, oils and scents all belong to her. The shekere, the thumb piano, bells of all sorts, violins and the singing voice are hers. In her diverse paths, she may appear as a loyal sister, dedicated friend, mourner gone mad, harlot, caregiver to the elderly, she who enchants the untamable beasts, a wise and resourceful woman, a clairvoyant and warrior, a scribe and counselor. Oshun is the owner of the words that bind or dismiss. She is an elegant negotiator, an intuitive and patient teacher, and an unsurmountable healer. The heart and the diamond, as well as all hues of yellow, green, orange, and pink are assigned to her, together with the number five and its multiples. So, this is just the beginning, let's say, of a first notion of who Oshun is. But before we talk about Oshun, let's say, as, a, as an earthy being, in the Yoruba mythology, there is a concept called Ojigijigi. And Ojigijigi is the primordial stone, is the primordial stone from which everything stems. So the story goes as this, we have heard of the Big Bang, but the Yoruba have their version of the Big Bang. There is the Ojigijigi, which is the concentrated essence or the power in the stone and that is the yin essence, the, the, the female essence, let's say the, the feminine principle. When there is the Big Bang, when there is the explosion, that is considered the yang energy, the male energy. But from that explosion, there is that primordial stone, ojigijigi, which is the female concentrated essence that which is found in darkness, that which is found in contraction, that which is concave, and that precisely is the principle of Oshun. Now, Oshun is considered to have a star that is hers, and this is Iwori Awala, which means the star that unites heaven and earth, and this is the star of Venus, so this is the star that belongs to Oshun. So Oshun in reality, what is she? She is the force of attraction between opposites that come together to generate something 
beautiful, something useful, something of benevolence in this realm, in this earthy realm. So that is why we talk about her, about fertility, about her power to generate, about her power of conciliation, because Oshun is the ability to regard the importance and the power and the energy, the ashe, the beauty that there is in every single person, being, or situation. And Thank you. And to take advantage of that in order to generate and create something more. There is a, a, a treaty, a, a liturgy, let's say, of the Yoruba people that is called the Book of Ifa from the prophet Orumila. And this is a compilation of 256 Odu. Odu translates into womb. So these are 256 wombs, let's say, of knowledge. And there is a very important one that uh, belongs to Oshun that is called Oshetura. There is a story where Olo Dumare, the Most High, when we divide that word, it is Olu, the owner, Odu, the womb of Shumare, of the rainbow. So the owner of the womb of the rainbow decides that she will send her Irumole. These are beings, divinities, or divine beings that have not experienced an earthy birth, but that are going to be sent to the earth, to Aye, to create something here. So these 201 Orumole are sent, and these are of male energy, and only one of female energy, which is Oshun. So they come to earth, and there are there are these reunions and councils that take place, but the Irumole never invite Oshun because Oshun is the only female and she's the youngest one. And besides, she has been taking care of everyone and cooking for everyone and being nurturing everyone. So why why would she call why would we call her? But what happens is that um, everything starts to go barren in the world. Women cannot have children. The trees have no fruits. All the rivers are dry. And they don't, they don't understand what is going on. So they travel again to Olodumare to ask what is going on. And they tell the situation. They tell of the situation. And Olodumare says, well, did you remember to include Oshun? Have you consulted with Oshun? And they realize that they have not. So Olodumara says, you must beg forgiveness from Oshun, and you must uh, propitiate her with gifts to see if she changes her mind. And the moment that they do that, and they start to acknowledge her, and they start to revere her, then things start to get well in the world again. There is fertility. Women start to have children. And the order of things is changed. But we are not talking about Oshun as, as a personality. We are talking about Oshun as the, the feminine principle. That if the feminine principle is not regarded and respected, that principle where everything is nurtured, that principle where the seed of things are implied and are taken care of and are measured with care and with dedication and with devotion, nothing can be done. So this is one of the important aspects of, of the goddess of Oshun. If we, if we look at the attributes, for example, um, of the animals that belong to her, the bee, the hummingbird, all these animals have to do with pollination. All these animals have to do with the continuation of life. 
All these animals have to do with knowing how to live in community. The birds, the, the bees actually have a memory and they talk to one another and they tell each other the trail where they have found or the flowers where they have found pollen. So these, these are animals that have special systems of communication for a very specific goal. They're, they're communal works for goals that will benefit the whole community. You look at the peacock, for example. The peacock is a, a beautiful bird and is a bird that, it, that is, uh, let's say, ostentatious in its beauty, but you must look at its feet. So there is the contrast always that Oshun says, remember, remember beauty, but there is always, to, to every, every sweetness, there is bitter. To everything that is salty, there is something sweet. Look at the counterpart in the, in the situations. This is what Oshun begs us to look at, to be careful with detail, to be careful with excessive vanity because um, people have had this idea, this very uh, easy idea about Oshun being beautiful, being vain, being coquettish. And this is so mediocre to um, look at such a principle in such a pedestrian way because Oshun in reality is the grace in life, is the beauty in life, is the principle of beauty that makes a difference in life, that makes you be in awe. So Oshun invites you to be in awe of life, to be in awe of love, to be in awe of the erotic, to be in awe of what can be, to stop and look and watch at the moon, at the stars, at the earth, at the flowers, at the person that you love, at the baby that you're carrying in your womb. This is the principle of Oshun. Oshun is also a principle of justice, and you see it in Oshetura. There has to be justice, there has to be respect. This is why Oshun, it, that principle that we talked about, Ojigi Jigi, when, when the initiates are going, when people are going to be initiated, they must go to the river because Oshun is their witness. They come to Oshun to beg for her blessing. And why do they beg for her blessing? Because Oshun is the principle of transformation. She is the one that is capable of washing your old self so that you can become anew. That is why the Yawo goes to the river and has to pick a stone from the river in the memory of that Ojigi-Jigi, of that primordial stone that you will never forget that we come from that stardust, that we come from that stone and that that is the concentrated female essence. Uh, there is a, a, a very beautiful, these are, these are some of the illustrations. This is uh, one of Yemaya, and I'm going to speak about this patakin. Patakin means story. There is a patakin of Yemaya in Oshun, where Oshun in this particular uh, road has become very, very poor. She has lost one of her children and she goes almost mad uh, in her mourning. She becomes very, very poor. All the bronze and all the copper and all the gold she once possessed, she has no longer. And she is forced to start to wash clothes for other people. And she gets paid for this. So she goes to the river and she washes and she washes the clothes and they're giving her these, stone, th these um, coins in payment. But one day she goes to the river to, to wash clothes and she loses her coins, the only coins that, that she has left. So finally, since all the rivers go to the sea, she goes to Yemaya 
And she begs of Yemaya. She says, please, Yemaya, I have, I have nothing left. I only had those, those coins that they gave me when I was washing. Why don't you please, I know that you are capable of doing everything or anything that you wish. Please remove the water so that at least I can find my, my coins. And Yemaya says, yes, I, I have no problem with that. I'll do it. And Yemaya removes the waters and all the treasures appear, all the bounty of all the ships that have been wrecked, everything that is, that is in the ocean and in the rivers, all the riches are there exposed. And Oshun goes, and the only thing she does is go and pick the five little coins that belong to her. So this is the principle of Oshun. It's the absolute respect for what is right, the uh, acknowledgement that one must not take more than what one gives, the principle of honesty as, as a way of having a community and a life that, that everyone is worthy of. So when Yemaya sees this and sees that Oshun has the ability to take more than what she has taken and she does not, Yemaya grants her all the riches. She declares that all the riches should be hers. And she is adorned again with all the precious stones and all the pearls and all the gold and all the bronze and everything becomes hers once again. Now, there is another illustration, um, the, the other one, Berta, where we have the, um, the Beji, okay. This is um, a patakin of the Beji. Now, the Beji are the miraculous twins. They uh, were born of Oshun and Chango. Chango, which is the Orisha of male fertility, of drums, of percussion, of virility, of diplomacy as well, of male beauty. We have to remember that Shango was born with the oracle. The oracles were, were his before then they belongs to, to Orumila. But Shango loved so much the drums and dance that he negotiated with Orumila and he begged him please to give him the drums and that he would give him the, the ability to read the oracles, and so they did that. So the Beji, the sacred twins, are born of Oshun and of Shango. They perform all sorts of miracle because, you know, they are these two souls, or the, this, these two souls that are born in one. They do all sorts of miracles, and, and there is a, you know, the, the lore says that everybody starts to find out that they're miraculous, that they are wondrous, and that they can do anything they want. So abita, which is the principle of evil, let's say, uh, it is not actually the devil, because in, in Yoruba lore there is not that, uh, let's say, that, that notion per se, the Judeo-Christian notion of devil, but there is the notion of evil. So evil finds out about these twins that are performing miracles, and he wants to end these Ibeji. You know, he, he has to kill them somehow. And the Ibeji, what they decide is that they are going to trick evil with two little drums. So these two um, Ibeji, these two twins, Taiwo and Kehinde, decide to get two little drums and they uh, tell Abita to go into the forest and catch them. And if he is able to catch them, he will win. And so one runs to the east and the other one runs to the west. And evil Abita starts to run towards the east and while he thinks that he is almost arriving, then the other Ibeji starts to play to the west. And so now evil is hearing that the west uh, the drums it, it is at the west, and he starts to run once again. And finally, the Beji conquer just because Abita grows so tired that he recognizes that the Beji have won. So this is yet another metaphor for the triumph of innocence and beauty 
over evil. All these are extensions because you see that these are associations of Oshun. These are, are the principle of, of Oshun. She is fertility. She is the one that takes care of the womb, that whispers to the womb, that whispers to the baby so that things can come to a correct fruition. Uh, Oshun is the principle of the respect for the female. So let's say that the principle of being a feminist is born in Oshun. Um, it is also important to see that there are chants in where Oshun is called the illumined one, the, the woman that has illumination. Um, there is a chant Iamile oro, Iamile oro, Bobo ache, Iami sarama woe, Iamile which means Iyami, my mother, Ile Oro, the house of our tradition, Bogbo Ache, full of wonderment, Obini Saramawo, Obini, the woman, Saramawo, that has illumination, that has the clairvoyance. Aye, so it is. Iyami le oro, Iyami le oro, Bogbo ache, Obini sarama woe. That is one of her chants. That is one of her chants. Now, since we're, we're in a room here and there are many of us, it would be beautiful if we are able to create a chant for Ochun together. So, would you like to do that? Okay. So I was thinking that maybe in the, in, the, in the rows in the back, we could start to create the bottom of the river just with the feet. So the people that are in the back can do that. If you want to clap, you can clap. If you want to do it with your feet, you can do it with your feet. And then the rows that follow, I'm going to ask you to create the heart of a shoe. Ide were were ide osuo ide were were ide were were ide osuo ide were were ide ia o chakiniwa ide osun cheke cheke ide ia ide were were 
This a friend of mine, um, daughter of Oshun, told, taught me a, a chant. Now, this is a chant uh, that is sung to Oshun when the initiates go into what they call the Ronko. It's uh, when they have to be in seclusion. Um, some people do it, um, let's say, during a month. Some others have to do it during three months. And they're completely in seclusion. And this is a chant done for Oshun because they know that the presence of Oshun is in the Honko, is in the, this, this uh, room of seclusion because the, the Iawo is being born. It's like a baby. So Oshun is taking care of this new person that is just being born. And they're talking about Iya lolori, ololori. Iya, my mother, ololori. Ololori is a path of Oshun where she is the diviner. So when you are reborn, the system of Dilogun that we spoke about before of the cowrie shells, uh, your future is read to you with the cowrie shells of Oshun. So they are recognizing and they are praise, praising the presence of Oshun in the Honko. So it's a very short chant. I'm going to sing it to you. Ala pansu e mina de Ala pansu e mina de Thank you very much. Everyone, a big applause for Vivian Regueros. Thank you. So now we have, we're going to invite Tanya, but Tanya Torres back up to the stage. We have one, the route to the Madonna, one more 
um, stop in the Caribbean before we go to Mexico. So, um, so please welcome Tanya Torres, and she's going to give us a little bit about um, information about um, the manifestation in Puerto Rico. Well, thank you. I'm going to take you on a little walk to Hormigueros, Puerto Rico. Um, I went there recently. I was I, actually I moved my studio to Puerto Rico um, for reasons I never expected, but I was lucky to be able to have a beautiful little house there to hide away and paint Mary Magdalene. So these are the paintings I brought from there um, through this process of um, painting the dark Magdalene, which in the beginning I thought it was a connection to the Black Virgin. And I also thought, well, I'm going to go there alone and be alone and be in the countryside with all the little creatures and all the darkness and the stars and the moon and everything that was unexpected and, and beautiful, but at the same time, a little scary. So that's another meaning of why this is the, the dark Magdalene. Um, and in the process of painting the, the dark Magdalene, I took a little trip to Hormigueros because Elena invited me to talk to you about La Virgen de Hormigueros, who is a black virgin. And she's called La Virgen de Monserrate, uh, the Virgin or, of Monserrate or Our Lady of Monserrate. Um, last year, I, I was traveling through, through Europe and I went to visit the Black Madonna of Monserrate in near Barcelona. And I thought that this were the two, the same, uh, the same um, uh, manifestations of the Virgin Mary. But in the process of researching her, I, I found some things. Um, this is the image of the Virgin of Hormigueros. Uh, she is in a, in a little basilica at the top of a mountain in this little town near where I live in San Germán. Um, the next slide, please. And this is how you get up there. You have to go all the 90-something steps. Some people do it uh, on their knees. Um, I didn't do it on my knees. I don't think I'm capable of that. Um, but I did go up, and it's really beautiful. So we keep going. This is a view of the church. Next. Um, this, is, uh, this is the altar and a very ancient painting, one of the, the, ver the, mo the, the very first paintings of Puerto Rico. And this is the Madonna of Montserrat um, in, in the mountains. Um, it's not very clear because the painting is deteriorated, but it's right there in the altar. If you ever go to the west side of Puerto Rico, you can come visit this uh, small basilica and see this painting. Um, this is a painting of the miracle that established this site. Um, the next. Uh, it's, this is, um, the story is that this man, and I forget the name right now, but it's in the next slide. Um, well, this is uh, how you go down. And I put this slide here just so that you could see why they built this uh, church on top of a mountain so that you could see all this beauty. In the, in the picture, it's not that it doesn't look the way it looks in real life. So the, the idea is that you go there and you enjoy it. Um, but it's really beautiful. So this is, um, this is something that, that caught my attention because I was all along thinking that the Virgen de Montserrat de Hormigueros was the Vir Virgen de Montserrat, but no. She's really uh, the same as the Virgen de Montserrat de Orihuela Alicante. And she is, um, as you can see, the image is very similar. It's another black virgin, but from the south of Spain. The next slide, please. Um, and I just wanted to make very quickly a connection to uh, the Santeria uh, Saints, Yewa, is syncretized with the Virgin of Montserrat in Santeria. I'm not an expert. My, my friend Mercedes is the one that teaches me all about this, but I didn't have it, the time to consult with her. So maybe after this you get interested and then you can ask her or you can ask Vivian or somebody else. <laughs> 
So the name of the man is Giraldo Gonzalez, and the story is that he was at the top of the mountain looking for material for his uh, baskets, and he encounters a, a wild bull. And because he couldn't do anything, he just prayed to the virgin. And she appeared and made the bull kneel and saved the man. So for that reason, he built a chapel like an hermit, uh, her hermitage to the virgin. And that was the beginning of this big uh, church. And then there was a second miracle, the next slide. And Her Giraldo's uh, little daughter was lost in the woods around uh, the church that was already started but wasn't completed. And she was lost for 15 days. And when she reappeared, she said that a, a woman had taken care of her. And she was in good state and she, she was perfectly fine. And everybody concluded that it was La Virgen, La Virgen de Monserrate that had taken care of her all that time. So those are the two miracles that established this tradition. And this is really one of the most popular um, uh, Virgenes de Puerto Rico. Um, I am going to skip this because you already heard it in our first part, um, The Voyages of the Black Madonna uh, with Alessandra. And it's, it's really um, the, the, same, the same thing. Um, and I was, uh, I was making the connection to Mary Magdalene, which uh, I, I need to tell you that I've been painting Mary Magdalene since 2005. And it was part of the, a project that I created together with my friend Raquel Rivera, Raquel Zeta Rivera. She is, um, she's a sociologist, but also a singer, and she wrote seven songs of praise to Mary Magdalene. And as she was writing the songs, I was painting uh, my first series of Mary Magdalene's, and we would get together in my studio and just talk about our project for five years and create it together, and I would um, sometimes give her some rhymes, or she would tell me what she thought about the paintings, and it was a collaboration that was very um, uh, natural and organic, and, and then, Together we presented this project, and ever, ever since then, I've continued to paint Mary Magdalene at least once a year. And this year, I painted all this, um, especially these paintings uh, of Mary Magdalene, the dark Magdalene, connecting her to the Black Virgin and, and to the ideas behind uh, this icon. So I hope that you enjoy the exhibition. I know that some of you arrived early and w were able to look at the paintings. And if you have any questions afterwards, I'll be here and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Once again, an applause for Tanya Torres. And if any of you didn't get a chance to look at her artwork, a lot of her artwork has some of the images over here that you might not have got a chance to see and has incorporated the goddesses, the early goddesses, um, figures from Europe and the Mediterranean, um, some of her other pieces. So um, if you get a chance um, if later today maybe afterwards or if you come back, you can see, get a closer look at some of her artwork. Um, but right now, we are going to um, move to Mexico and we are going to um, have with us um, Maza Arte. Maza Arte is a Bronx-based dance ensemble and it is led by... Um, Martha Zarate from, Me from Puebla, Mexico, and she leads the, 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 the ensemble, the troupe. And today they, are, they perform many of the folk dances from regional folk dances from Mexico, but today they're going to focus a little bit on um, the songs to Guadalupe. Now Guadalupe, then they're also going to talk a little bit about that too, the sort of connection that Guadalupe has. Guadalupe also has um, sort of like a, a connection from Spain as well as sort of her story also in Mexico that a lot of you probably know about the vision on sighting on Tepeyac, so um, the mountain in Mexico. But um, so um, we, they're gonna be here any minute and we are going to get um, the, um, the Madonna, the Black Madonna and as she comes into um, Central America and to Mexico. And um, we're gonna have a dance performance and some music first and then a little bit of information about her history. So, and also just one thing I wanna say, just a little shout out, um, Martha, um, is part of an exhibit, What We Bring, that is at City Lore. She's, um, City Lore has an, an exhibit about immigrant artists. 
And Tom Van Buren, the, the anthropologist in back, he's the, one of the co-curators of that. There's information about it at the desk. Martha's one of the featured artists in it. As well as, um, if you get a chance later on, we'll see the whole, um, our new mural um, by Fernando Lechon from Ecuador. He's also featured in the mural. So, um, so she's part of that exhibit as well. And we're really glad to have her perform here, her and her ensemble. So welcome to the stage, Maza Arte.
Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Now we're going to introduce Dolores, who's one of the executive directors of Masa Arte, who will give us a talk on La Virgen de la Guadalupe. How about it, ladies and gentlemen? Hi, good evening, everyone. Those were the Masarte dancers, and they just did uh, pre-Hispanic dances for us. So, um, if you, we can get the first slide up. Also, other dances that you're gonna see coming up, one of which is called the Xochipitzawa dance, and that is a dance that, uh, the word Xochipitzawa means little flowers. And we associate the apparition of flowers, specifically roses, uh, when the Virgen de Guadalupe is, is present. You either get a, a strong smell, a strong aroma of, of flowers. Um, and that's kind of where her story begins as she appeared uh, in 1531 to Juan Diego. And after he went repeatedly several times to the bishop to tell him that he kept on ring it, running into this beautiful um, dark skin, what he called at the time goddess, but it was our, our Virgin of Guadalupe uh, as we know her today. Um, several times, he wouldn't believe her. And so when they finally um, believed her, believed him in, in the apparition, it came to be as, of, as when the flowers that she told him, take, take to the bishop, show him these flowers that I'm giving to you. And um, upon doing so, what we know of today as her image is what, is what appeared on, on what is a cloak that he had with him, which is a tilma. Um, and the slide here that I, I wanted to share with you folks has um, symbolism. I'm gonna start from the bottom up, uh, basically because uh, in order to tie the elements of the, of the sky to the earth, we can see on the bottom, the angel has uh, wings that are comprised of the Quetzal bird, which is also another dancer we're gonna see a little later on, the Quetzal dance. Pelican um, uh, feathers, and, and, um, it's, it's the, and this is where the, um, the angel at the bottom, he's holding one of the blurbs that they put on there, covers it up, but he's tying up the part of the tunic along with her covering that represents the sky and the earth. So he's kind of bringing that together. Then as we go up, um, we, see, we see the moon and it represents day and, day and night. She's kind of like embodying both, both parts. And if um, the, the uh, Aztec word from uh, Mexico, Mexico, uh, means the center of the moon. And then as we go up, we see the uh, Nawi Oyin flower, which is a Nahuatl symbol that uh, represents the presence of God. And then we go up even higher, uh, the, the brown ties that are coming down from her hands is pretty much like a tie around her waist, demonstrating that she is with child. Um, and it's also uh, believed, also symbolizing that she's with child with the new uh, mestizaje, the new race that is about to to uh, come into being uh, between the indigenous and the Spanish upon their arrival. After which, when we dance Xochipitzawa dances, uh, the notion of dancing these uh, Xochipitzawa dances in honor of the uh, Aztec goddesses, it's now, she's now replaced by uh, Virgen de Guadalupe. Uh, then we have the, um, the rays of the sun, which is not very clear here, but as you go up further, uh, to the level of her abdomen, they're actually brighter. Again, also pointing to um, her being with child. And then there's, um, it's a little dark on the slide, but the stars that are on the cloak are actually, when uh, analyzed, um, it was discovered that they are in the form of a lot of the um, constellations that could only have been uh, present the year of her apparition. 
again, 1531. She's kind of like a teenager in comparison to the other virgins we heard about earlier because those appeared in like 500 and 700, so she's a little bit, a little bit younger. <laughs> um, and then, of course, she has, her hands are in prayer, so she's uh, obviously paying reverence to, to someone, but to, to the higher God. But also, one of, uh, upon closer inspection, one of her hands is a little bit darker than the other, so she's kind of, and she's bringing the two together, so again, it's a coming together of, of the races. Um, and then we go up even more, we see her hair is, is not tied, it's, it's loose. And this is also a, um, a symbol of, um, of purity, of virginity. And then I'm, I'm leaving you know, her eyes for the end because here in comes uh, some more interesting facts um, where if we go to um, the next slide, it was discovered uh, in the early 19th century. There was a photographer that kind of um, looked into uh, her eyes with telescope, with, you know, um, not with telescope, with microscope rather, and discovered that the figure of the the figure the shape of a man could be discerned if we go to the next slide please and if you look carefully uh it's believed that this is the virgin mary looking upon juan diego as he's presenting um his his story his findings to the bishop um and and they and that was in 1929, that, that was discovered by a photographer, Alfonso Marco y Gonzalez. Um, and ever since, it's kind of like, you know, been a mystery because upon further inspection in 1936, the Bishop of Mexico con uh, insisted on in analyzing the fibers of the uh, cloak and they couldn't find any, any, chem any um, element in, in, in um, in the cloak that would match any of the elements found on the uh, chemistry table. So they have no idea what it's made out of to this day. And they haven't been able to pin it down because none of the, none of the paints are of veg vegetable nor, minimal, nor mineral nor animal uh, origin. Um, and so in, 1930, in, in, in 1936, when the bishop insisted on uh, further researching and further analyzing the cloak, um, they took it a step further, and uh, Dr. Richard Kuhn, who was actually Jewish <laughs> in origin, uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize uh, in 1938 and 1949 as a result of his continued studies of, of the, comp the composition of the cloak, which they were not able to determine. So um, those were kind of like the facts that I wanted to lay out there, interesting facts of the Virgen de Guadalupe. So her feast is on December 12th which is also uh, the anniversary of her apparition. And again, uh, very much in line with the other um, guests that we had earlier today, she, does, she appeared at the top of the Tepeyac uh, Hill, uh, which is where her, where her basilica is today. So um, just to tell you guys a little bit more uh, while the um, dancers are changing into their next outfits, um, a little bit about Mazarte Dance Company. So the dances that you're gonna see coming up, the Quetzal dance and then the Xochipitzawa Sochi, dance also uh, danced uh, on, the, on her feast day in the courtyard of the Basilica, which is, if anyone has ever visited, is a huge space. So um, there's a lot of dancers, a lot of groups, a lot of people that kind of take these as offerings to her, as a veneration to her. Um, and they also reach the Basilica on their knees uh, in exchange for favors or as a thank you to her for some kind of miracle that she may have performed for them throughout. So, um, Mazarte Dance Company, we came to being in 2012, and we travel around the city, taking the cultural you know, beauty and appreciation of, Mexi of Mexico to, <laughs> to everyone so that for you all to enjoy. So tonight's a little bit of that. We have our trio Sierra Alegre, Alegre who's gonna, um, um, treat us with their sones uh, wapangueros uh, this evening. So I leave you with them.
Igual la que el compañero te pasa a los de María. Como hay agua los de Pantuna, si Santa María Guadalupe. Igual la que el compañero te pasa a los de María. Como hay agua los de Pantuna, si Santa María Guadalupe. Compañeros, te pasa los de María, como ya a los de Pantona, si Santa María Guadalupe, igual a compañeros, te pasa los de María, como ya a los de Pantona, si Santa María Guadalupe.
su bella serranía, por su bella serranía, mi guasteca es un primor, mi guasteca es un primor, por su bella serranía, por su bella serranía, mi guasteca es un primor. Ahí vemos el pintor dibujando su poesía a la mujer y la flor, a todas horas del día. Hasta las 
corvas me tallo y aparece que en las piso. Señor, para sus amigos del trío Sierra Alegre. Gracias, gracias. Vamos aquí. I'm sorry. Before we go, for us it's very important that everybody participate with us. So the trío Sierra Alegre is gonna do one more song. And we will love everybody to come and dance with us. This is a song huasteco. This is a very, very traditional music in, in, in any celebration in Mexico. Weddings, uh, quinceañeras, bautism, any, any, any celebration. Then if there's musicians, there's always dance. So then, please, can you come and dance with us? Please. Please. Don't be shy, please, don't be shy. Vengan a bailar con nosotros. Por favor, todos, todos a bailar. Ok, ok. Bueno, nosotros somos sus amigos del trío Sierra Alegre. Desde aquí de, de Bronx Music. Sí, señor. Bueno, vamos a tocarles este son que se llama El Carreque. Ya toda la gente lista para bailar. Ya que para que cerrar con broches de oro, señores. Listos. Y arrancamos, sí, señor. Buena una cervecita para el que anda desvelado, para el que anda desvelado. Es buena una cervecita, es buena una cervecita para el que anda desvelado. Sí señor, es buena una cervecita. Yo prefiero un tequilita, lo mejor para el luchado, lo mejor para el luchado. Y hasta los pasos se quitan, que reque, que reque. Oh! 
por vez primera, se casó por vez primera, el que reque en la Huasteca. Pero le salió una oferta, que esa también la quisiera, se enamoró una maestra para que lo mantuviera. Que reque, que reque. Aquí presentando nuestra música huasteca desde Bronx Music. Everyone, un aplauso, un aplauso. Trio Sierra, Sierra Alegre. Trio Sierra Alegre. Y Maza Arte. Aplauso a Maza Arte. ¿Quieren otra? O ya con eso. Todo el mundo a las 3, 1, 2, 3. ¡Que viva México! Muchas gracias a todo el mundo. Que Dios los bendiga. Que viva el Bronx. 
¡Que viva la comunidad mexicana, italiana, cubana, puertorriqueño, colombiana, africana! Cecilia, por tu mirar, me estoy mareando de amor, me estoy mareando. ¡Y que viva la Madonna! Cecilia, por tu mirar, como no te puedo hablar, escúchame por favor, escúchame por favor, si acaso me oyes cantar. Sus hermanos no la dejaban casar, no la dejaban casar. A Cecilia, sus hermanos, ella es de tiranos, como queriendo llorar, lo que no me den hermanos, no me lo deben quitar. Gracias, gracias, thank you. I want to thank everyone for coming today and thank you for sharing our long roots of the Madonna with us. I want to thank Tanya, Alessandra, Steve, Vivian, who else was here? Dolores, uh, Marta, and, and Maserati, and, and all the musicians and dancers who were here tonight. 